Well, we are in 1 Samuel chapter 23 this morning. Continuing saga of David and Saul. This battle between David, who pictures for us so much of the time in Scripture, Jesus, the greater than David. Jesus would be known as the son of David. Uh, that was one of the titles that he, he held. And he did come from the lineage of David. Um, so he is related to David in, in the sense that David was part of the tribe of Judah, as Jesus would be. Um, but David was just a man now. He was just a guy who had failings and faults and problems like every one of us. But because he knew the, the Lord, because he was a man after God's own heart, David would picture Jesus Christ many times throughout the stories, not because David was so great, but because God was so great in using David and to use him to paint a picture of his son. And you and me experience the same thing. Even though we're failed and many times we are, are falling short, we are still being used by the Lord to show people who Jesus is. And, and of course, we don't aim to fail, but we don't have to, do we? You don't have to aim to fail in order to fail. We are flawed, and we're still dealing with this thing called the flesh, which will come into play because David is a picture of Jesus, but Saul, the king of Israel, pictures the flesh for us and the, the old nature, the old man, the, the one who kind of wants to run things like the king of Israel, Saul, wanted to run things. He wanted to control everything. And uh, his control over things was kind of wicked. It was, uh, it was a ripoff. It, it was uh, selfishness. It was self-centeredness. And, and that's the old man for us. That's the old nature that we have. And it's a constant battle, the Apostle Paul will say, that there's a war going on in, in us, that the old nature and the new nature are warring against each other. The Spirit of God in you and your old flesh nature are at war. And so they're never going to get along. Just a heads up. See, I'm just trying to make peace between my old nature and my... It's hopeless. Your old nature will never be at peace with your new man. And your new man will never be able to get along with your old man. They are diametrically opposed to one another. So we saw that last time David failed at dealing with someone that he should have. And this is one of those realities that we face over and over again, I think. And perhaps over the course of of your life, you've, you've known experiences just like this where you knew something was there, you knew something was a problem and you should have dealt with it, but you didn't. And then it came back and, and bit you. David was aware of a, a guy named Doeg. Remember him? Doeg was working for King Saul. He was there at Ahimelech's place in Nob, and David saw Doeg and realized who he was, but didn't do anything about it. And lo and behold, Doeg went back to Saul and told Saul that, that he had seen David and where David was. And, and what ended up happening was Saul killed or had killed all the priests of Nob and all their families because he was so angered at them for, for helping David, for being a part of what David was all about. And so we saw David's grieved over that in the last part of the previous chapter. And he said, and I'll just read it to you in verse 22, David said unto Abiathar, I knew it that day when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, and I have occasioned the death of all the persons of thy father's house. <clears throat> David says, it's my fault that all the priests are dead because I should have dealt with that guy, Doeg. Doeg's name means anxious and fearful. And Doeg represents that, 
fear and anxiousness that comes to us, and if it's not dealt with, will end up bringing death to some area of our life. And we all sense that anxious fear, don't we? It's a, it's a means that the devil uses to try and get us to get caught up in and, and, and never be able to do anything because it paralyzes us. Fear and anxiety it can paralyze you. And David didn't deal with Doeg, and Doeg was the one that ended up killing all the priests. So David now, he tells uh, Abiathar, which is Ahimelech's son, he says, Abide thou with me and fear not, for he that seeketh my life seeketh thy life, but with me thou shalt be in safe guard. Great picture there. David says, you stay with me and we will be together and uh, I'll keep you safe. Yeah, just like the Lord, you know. But now, moving into chapter 23, it says, Then they told David, them probably being messengers. David had people all over the place that would report back to him, just like Saul did. So there was these spies and counter spies. <laughs> It was kind of that way. There was people spying things out constantly, reporting back to either Saul or reporting back to David. And so they, they told David, some of these spies, saying, Behold, the Philistines fight against Keilah, and they rob the threshing floors. Keilah is a little place, a city, that was about 12 miles uh, from Gath. Now, you should know what Gath is. Gath was the city of the Philistines, where Goliath was from. We saw that David went there at one point and had to pretend like he was crazy. We saw that, remember? He, he pretended that he was nuts because he was in the enemy camp and he was drooling and all that. But the point is, is that this place, Keilah, is just about 12 miles from Gath, and that's too close to the enemy's camp. Gath was a major Philistine city, and this was way too close. So what we see in this little place called Keilah is the vulnerability of God's people. In other words, when you're 12 miles from Gath, you are very vulnerable. The enemy's way too close. And you can relate to this. There are parts of your life that are too close to the enemy. And that's where you're vulnerable. Well, why would, why would they live that close to the enemy? Good question. But you have little kilas in your life. There's places that you might frequent, things you might be a part of that are too close to the enemy. And you're vulnerable there. But here's the interesting thing. David is told, hey, the Philistines, they are robbing the threshing floors of the people of Keilah. So they're ripping them off. So therefore, watch this, David inquired of the Lord, saying, shall I go and smite these Philistines? So David immediately, when he hears what's going on, prays to the Lord. That's the right thing to do. Just the absolute right thing. As soon as you hear there's trouble, what do you do? Well, I try and deal with it. <laughs> That's what a lot of people would say. I just try and deal with it, make it work out. Shouldn't be that way. You should turn to the Lord like David does is and inquire, Lord, what, what do you want me to do here? So while Saul is plotting and planning things against David, David is praying to the Lord. Two different ways of going about things. One guy, Saul, plots and plans. David prays. Which do you do? Well, probably both, you say. Usually we plot and plan. When it doesn't work out, then we pray. <laughs> it's like a last resort. You know, well, nothing else worked. I guess I'll pray. So David inquires and asks the Lord, shall I smite these Philistines? What do you think the Lord's going to say? The Lord says, and to David, go and smite the Philistines and save Keilah. So the Lord answers quickly. 
Of course you should go destroy the Philistines. Philistines, again, picture the enemy of God, the enemy of God's people. The devil and the flesh and all the things that come against us are represented in these enemies of Israel, the Philistines. So God says, of course I want you to go and deal with them. Now, David, listen, David has been considered now for quite a while an outlaw. He's on the run from the authorities, from King Saul and all his men, who are the rulers of Israel. So he's considered an outlaw, but he's still willing to fight the battles of the Lord for the deliverance of the people of Israel. Even though he's on the run and being hunted, he, he continues to fight the battles for the Lord. And so David's men said unto him, Well, we be afraid here in Judah. How, how much more then if we come to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? So when the men of David hear that they're going to go fight this battle, they said, Listen, we're, we're scared here in Judah. What's going to happen if we go there near the Philistines and fight? I mean, we're already afraid. <laughs> and even though that's an honest assessment of where they're at, it's not going to play out because God's not afraid, even though you are at times. And they're scared, but David isn't scared, and God's not scared. So their fears will have to be abated here and abandoned, really. Because, you know, they're fearful that they're going to get taken out. But, but David inquired of the Lord yet again. So he asked the Lord, I think in the presence now of these men, he prays again. And, and the Lord answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into thine hand. So the Lord answers David again, and David conveys that to his men. Listen, God has handed these Philistines over to us. We don't have to worry. Now, you hear that promise every single day when you read your Bible. You don't have to be afraid. The Lord has delivered you. The Lord has handed the enemy over to you. He's no match right, for you, because you have the Spirit of God in you, and greater is he that is in you than he that is in this world. You hear that every day, but does it take care of, does it deal with all the fears and anxieties you have? Maybe, maybe not. It kind of depends. But David assures the men that, hey, we can do this because God has delivered them. So David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their cattle and smote them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Yay, David, right? And his men, as reluctant and fearful as they might have been, they went with David and the victory was won. That's the reality, folks is that our greater than David, he leads the way. Jesus is our leader. Jesus is the head of the church, amen? He is the one that's leading us, and if he's leading us, then we don't have to be afraid because he is going to save and deal with those things that we can never deal with. But it says that David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. Even though his men were along for that battle, it was really the leading of David that brought about the victory. You got to have a leader. And so the big question is, who's the leader? And for many, it's like, well, I, I guess I'm the leader. I just lead myself. And that's a bummer, isn't it? If you're the leader, I don't want to go. If I'm the leader, you shouldn't want to go. But if Jesus is the leader... We should all want to go. So David leads the way, and these men get to share in the spoil and the victory, and they dealt with this place that pictures for us the vulnerability of our lives. And so David protects like Jesus protects 
where his people are vulnerable. And this is true for me. If I will ask the Lord to help me in those areas I'm vulnerable, he will protect me there. The problem isn't with the protection that Jesus provides in my vulnerabilities. The the problem lies in me asking for help. The problem is in me saying, Lord, deliver me from this. Help me in that area. Uh, I'm so vulnerable there. I'm too close to the enemy there. Help me. And he will. He'll come like David did here and take care of the enemy that's causing me to be so vulnerable. So it came to pass when Abiathar, this is the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Now he's got his father's priestly garments, and so he brings them with him. And up to this point, David must be just either praying to the Lord directly, as we've seen, or we do know that Gad... The prophet Gad was with David at this time and could have used Gad the prophet to pray with and to seek the Lord. But now he, he has an ephod when uh, Abiathar comes down to him. So it was told Saul now that David was come to Keilah. The news gets back to Saul that David has protected Keilah. And Saul said, well, God then hath delivered him into mine hand. For he is shut in by entering into a town that hath gates and bars. Keilah was a a walled city with gates. And so Saul looks at this opportunity to take David out because David is in this walled city with gates and all that. So if they surround the city, there's nowhere for David to go. He's trapped, he thinks. Now Saul is delusional. If you haven't picked that up by now. Everything that he sees is out of perspective. He won't believe, he won't buy into the reality that David actually is the anointed king of Israel. Even though he's heard it and he knows it's true, he won't buy into it, he won't believe it, he won't act upon it. So now he just simply thinks, well, this is a great opportunity for me to kill David because he's trapped in this walled city, and I can just surround the city. So Saul called all the people together to war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And David knew that Saul secretly practiced mischief against him. That's a nice way of putting it. David understands fully that the secret intents of Saul's heart is to destroy David. And the Lord knows that the secret intents of your old fleshly nature, your secret intent is to destroy the Lord in you. And that's what the old nature will try and do. When when you are a part of a victory like the men of David in, in taking and protecting Keilah, then your old nature looks at at an opportunity there to try and destroy the life of Christ in you. It's such a sick deal, I can hardly bear it, right? You ever get that way with your old self? Like, I'm so sick of my old self. You? If you're not sick of your old self, I'll be sick of it for you. (laughs) I'm sick of your old self. I'm sick of my old self. Because the old self is just nothing but wicked. Nothing but dark, and wants only to destroy the life that God has put in you through his son. It's all he wants. And he should be considered the enemy, right? Paul the Apostle, when talking about these two natures, he he uses a descriptive term to say that he puts his foot on the neck of the old man. (laughs) He puts his foot on the neck and he says, I don't let him up. My foot stays on the neck of that old man. Why? Because he's trying to destroy Christ in me. That's all he wants to do. And so if we're wise, we'll follow suit and get your foot and put it down. We would say, put your foot down. On what? On the old man. 
the old nature. Anything that is coming from the old nature, you should put your foot down on it and keep it on it. Step on it. Don't let him up. So Saul has secret desires, and David knows it, to practice mischief against him. And he said to Abiathar, David, the priest, bring hither the ephod. So David says, hey, let's inquire of the Lord. Bring the ephod. The ephod was that that breastplate that had the the urnum and the thummim on it. What What is that? It was the stones that were laid out on the breastplate, and they would seek the Lord. And we we don't know exactly how this worked. It's kind of a mystery. But somehow, which the urm and the therma means lights and beauty, and so it was this light-revealing kind of thing that would happen with the ephod. Don't understand it. Never saw it work, myself personally. But it's kind of a mysterious thing, but when they sought the Lord, somehow either the rocks lit up or something. I don't know. But it gave them a determination of whether the answer would be yes or no or or whatever. So David says, hey, bring the ephod. And then said David, O Lord, God of Israel, thy servant hath certainly heard that Saul seeketh to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. (laughs) Lord, I'm, I'm hearing reports that Saul wants to come and destroy this whole city just because of me. Now, David's already on the heels here of all the priests of Nob and their families being destroyed because of him. So he's, he's sensing that if this happens again, it's more than he can bear. He doesn't want the, the people of Keilah, the city, to be destroyed just because he has helped them and is there with them. So he, he says, Lord, I, I'm aware that, that Saul wants to, to kill me, but he's going to destroy this whole city for my sake. And so he asked the Lord, verse 11, this is interesting. He says, will the men of Keilah deliver me into his hand? When Saul comes, are these people going to turn on me? And he says, and will Saul come down as thy servant hath heard? So two questions in this prayer. Is Saul coming? From what I hear, he's coming down here. Is that true? And then secondly, is... uh, is this safe here, or are these people going to turn on me when Saul comes? He says, Lord, tell me, you know. He says, O Lord of Israel, I beseech thee, tell thy servant. And the Lord said, he will come down. Saul's coming, just like you heard. And then said David, Okay, uh, well, will, will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will deliver thee up. <laughs> yes, Saul's coming. And yes, these people will hand you over. Now, you would think after David risks his own life fighting the Philistines on behalf of these people that they would stand up for him. But this is a pretty accurate rendering of what happens. Jesus Christ didn't just risk his life, he gave his life for mankind. And like these people, they're going to hand David over to Saul, the flesh. They're going to turn him over to the flesh And that's what happens so often because Jesus gave his life for us, but so often we turn to the flesh for help or for whatever. This happens all the time. So the picture here is just kind of painted out for us that David asks, are they going to bail on me? Pretty much. Yep. Yep. And when Jesus, when he was on the cross, was he aware of the fact that that many of the people he was dying for were were simply going to continue in the flesh and continue in their sin? Yep. Did did he die for them then? Yes, he did. 1 John chapter 2. He is the propitiation for our sins, John says, but not ours only, but the sins of the whole world. 
So even though Jesus knew that many of the people he was dying for would never come to him, they would simply go return to the flesh and return to their sin and never, ever appreciate what he did. He did it anyway. And so David here is getting the news from the Lord. And I like this, partly, part, part of me doesn't like this, that God is so real. <laughs> I mean, David asked this tough question. So is Saul coming? And are these people going to hand me over? And God's like, yep. Yeah, he's coming. And yes, they're going to hand you over. Okay. Thanks for sharing. Feeling better now, right? <laughs> but God just tells him the truth. So then David and his men, which were about 600, arose and departed out of Keilah and went whithersoever they could go. And it was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah and he forbade to go forth. So Saul changed his plans when he found out David wasn't in Keilah anymore. David saved the lives of those people in Keilah because Saul decided not to go there because David wasn't there anymore. The only reason that he would have gone and slaughtered the people of Keilah is, is because David was there. It's kind of like, it's kind of like our adversary, Satan, he only cares about the things you're doing if they involve Christ. That's where he wants to attack. That's where he wants to get you. If Satan has somebody doing all the sinful, wicked things that, that he wants them to, then he doesn't even care. Why go and bother with them? But if David's there, if Jesus is there, if Jesus is in that, then that's when the enemy says, I'm going there and destroying that. I got to destroy that. I got to take that apart. So David and his men take off, and it says, whithersoever they could go, meaning wherever they could find a place to hide. Now, David by himself is one thing, but with 600 men, that's a little tougher to hide, 600 guys. And so he went wherever he could, and, and now Saul knows, okay, he's not in Keilah. So it says in verse 14, Then David abode in the wilderness in strongholds and remained in a mountain in the wilderness of Ziph. This is down by the Dead Sea. This is the wilderness that, if you've ever been to Israel, you know is really wilderness. It's rugged. It's pretty craggy rocks and cliffs and just dry and there's nothing really out there tough to find a place to hide <clears throat> you'd have to hide out in the in the rocks and all that ziph the, the the name ziph means refining so this is kind of a an interesting picture it's this place is about 15 miles southeast of Keilah where they were before but it's in that place that, that God will allow you to go. Is God allowing this? Yes. Did God tell David this is what was happening? Yes. So David knows that God is still with him, but he's finding himself in the wilderness of Ziph, not because David isn't walking with the Lord, but because Saul isn't walking with the Lord. That's why David's in the wilderness. And there are times when I go through wilderness things, places like Ziph, which are places of refining me, refining me like, like the refiner's fire that you would put the gold and silver in. It, it burns the dross off and purifies the gold. Heat doesn't destroy gold. It purifies it. And so the same thing applies when you go through times of refining. Things are getting burnt up but not the good stuff, not the pure stuff. That's being refined. So I have a need for refining. I, I don't, listen, I don't like refining, but I need refining. I like ice cream. <laughs> I mean, I like something. You know, I like good things, but refining's not like on the top of the list of, oh, good. It's time to be refined, right? 
turn the burner up, you're right, Whew. getting hot because the heat is on for David. He's in the wilderness of Ziph, and this is a place of refining for him. This is part of what God is using, though, in David's life to make him a man that will be able to rule Israel. He's going to be the king of Israel one day, but he needs to be refined. You're getting a good example of a king who isn't refined, who's in charge of Israel right now, in King Saul. God doesn't want that kind of king for his people anymore. So he's going to refine David. And by the time David is through with his experience in the wilderness running from Saul, he will be far better equipped to be the king of Israel. And for you and me, it's the same thing. What are you being refined in right now? Are things hot for you? Are things tough for you right now? For some, I'm, I'm sure, I mean, in a group like this, I'm sure there's lots of you that are going through tough things. There's refining happening. And those things that are refining you are not meant to destroy you. God never does things intentionally to destroy or harm you. Everything he's doing, as Paul says, is working together for good for those of us who love him and are called according to his plans. So everything that I'm going through is God refining or doing something. It's good for me. So David is being refined, and then it says Saul then sought him every day. Saul, the flesh, came after David every single day. And your flesh will go after Jesus in you, Christ in you, every single day. Your flesh will try to destroy your walk with the Lord every day. So you have to fight the battle with the flesh every single day. Don't take a day off, because Satan doesn't. If you take a day off, you're going to be in trouble because Satan doesn't take days off. He doesn't stop. And your flesh will always be at it, coming after you, coming after you. But I love this. So Saul sought him every day, but God delivered him not into his hand. So even though Saul came every day, God wouldn't allow Saul to take David down. But this is a day-to-day -day fight. I have to be engaged in this constantly. David had to be attuned to what was going on in order to keep going. So David, it says, saw that Saul was come out to seek his life, and David was in the wilderness of Ziph in a wood, there were some trees in this particular part of the wilderness in Ziph, and David was hiding out there. Probably a pretty obvious hiding place. Like you're in the wilderness, there's nothing out there, and there's a little group of trees. <laughs> Wonder where he's hiding. Probably in that group of trees right there. But here's, here's an interesting thing. Verse 16 says, And Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the wood. Jonathan knew where David was. He's been with Saul, but he knows where David is. And remember, we've talked about Jonathan's the man in the middle. He's the son of Saul, but his heart belongs to David. Just like you, you're, you're by nature of the flesh, right? Your, your father was from the flesh, and so you're a part of the flesh like Jonathan, but his heart was for David. And interestingly, even though he's been with Saul, he knows how to find David. You? You know how to find him? Where did Jonathan go to find Jesus? The wood. The cross. If you're not sure how to find Jesus, if you're out there wandering in the wilderness, go to the cross. It will tell you, it will speak to you again about the love that God has for you. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. How did he give him? He allowed him to be hung on a cross and crucified. So he goes to the wood. He knows how to find David. And it says that Jonathan strengthened 
his hand in God. Jonathan went to strengthen David. This is interesting. He, he goes and, and hangs out with David and encourages David. I think this is true still. And even though Jesus doesn't need my strength, I think it blesses him when I go to be with him as an encouragement to him. Well, can you encourage the Lord? Yes, you can. It blesses God when we go to him. Now, it's impossible to please God without faith, but with faith and going to be in his presence, there is blessing for him. It blesses him. That's why he wants us to come. So Jonathan goes and strengthens the hand of of David in God, and he said unto him, Fear not, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find thee, and thou shalt be king over Israel, and, and I shall be next to thee, and that also Saul my father knows. I, I'm telling you, David, you're going to be the king, and when you're king, I'll be beside you. Now, sadly, this is the last time Jonathan will see David. He won't be in this kind of ability to, to talk with David again. He may see him one more time, but he won't be able to talk to him. And, and afterwards, uh, Jonathan is going to die on the battlefield with his father Saul. But he meets with David here, and you gotta, you got to figure, man, this guy, what a great guy. I mean, he is just a great picture for us of someone who loves the Lord, even though he belongs, in a sense, to Saul, his father. So the two, verse 18, they two made covenant before the Lord, and David abode in the wood, and Jonathan went to his house. They separate. David stays there. Jonathan goes back to be with his father and and the army of Israel. But then came up the Ziphites. These are the people that lived in Ziph. Ziph, remember, means refining. The people of the refining place came up to Saul, to Gibeah, saying, Doth not David hide himself with us in strongholds in the wood, in the hill of Hakalah, which is on the south of Jeshimon? Now the the people of Ziph now run to Saul and say, Hey, you know, David's hiding out with us. He's hiding in the woods there. Now, therefore, O king, come down according to all the desire of thy soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him into the king's hand. Man, what a bunch of losers. (laughs) They run to Saul and say, we know where David's at. You can come get him. We'll just hand him over to you. So everybody seems to be turning on David. This is part of the... The refining for David, these people are from Ziph, refining. This is part of the refining for him that everyone seems to be turning against him. But even though the whole town of Keilah and Ziph have turned against David, David just got a visit from Jonathan. One man who came and made covenant with David afresh, renewed their covenant, and encouraged him and, and loved on him and blessed him. I th- think about the, the ten lepers that when they came to Jesus, Jesus healed them, remember? He healed them all. And uh, they all ran off. <laughs> and one of them came back to say thank you. One. And Jesus kind of looked at this one leper and he said, huh? Weren't there 10? Weren't there 10 lepers? Yeah. But he was thankful for the one that came back. Don't you want to be that one? Like, out of all the lepers, and we're all leprous, but out of all the lepers, don't you want to be the one that comes back and thanks Jesus? See, Jonathan, one guy, one man, that out of all these people that we're turning on David. This one man encouraged David, blessed him. 
So he's, he's kind of writing on that because these people are going to turn on him as well. So Saul, when he hears from these Ziphites, <laughs> when he hears from these people that they're willing to turn David over, Saul said, oh, blessed be ye of the Lord, for you have compassion on me. Oh, finally, Saul says, somebody feels sorry for me. Saul is all about Saul. Finally, you've had compassion on me. Oh, good. And he says, he blesses him in the name of the Lord. Whenever the flesh is blessing something in the name of the Lord, you've got to be wary of that. Because it's insincere, isn't it? How could... How could Saul be sincere in blessing people that are turning on David? Or put that in the, the picture term, and you've got, how can you trust the flesh who would turn on and try to destroy Jesus Christ in you? That's the idea. The insincerity of it, the hypocrisy of it. Saul's a hypocrite in spades, but he doesn't even seem to notice that he is, which is how hypocrites usually operate. So, he goes on now and tells these people, he says, now go, I pray you, prepare yet and know and see his place where his haunt is. He tells the, the people of Ziph, go find out where he hangs out all the time and who hath seen him there. Ask all your people. And he says, for it is told me that he that dealeth very subtly. King Saul says to these people, you gotta watch David. He's really tricky. And he's really subtle, and you can't trust him. Oh, boy. You got room to talk there, Saul. So he says, see, therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places he hideth himself. He makes David out like he's some kind of a slug crawling around in the dark holes of places. Oh, see where he, he hides himself and lurks around. And come ye again to me with the certainty. Find out exactly where he is and come tell me. And I will go with you and it shall come to pass if he be in the land that I will search him out throughout all the thousands of Judah. I'll find him if you can tell me exactly where he is. Brilliant. Draw me a map, and I'll get him. Right. So they arose, and they went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the plain on the south of Jeshimon. They've kind of changed locations. Seems as David kind of got wind of this whole thing. David was used to being turned on. Jesus is used to being turned on, isn't he? We live in a world that has turned on Christ. Nobody wants him. They don't want to hear his name. They don't want people like you and me to even bring the name of Jesus up in a conversation or in any way, shape, or form acknowledge that he exists. That's where we live. This is where we're at. And this is how David is being treated. Nobody... Is, is really with him, except for very few. So David and his men have moved. Saul, verse 25, also and his men went to seek him, and they told David, wherefore he came down into a rock and abode in the wilderness of Maon. And when Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. So now the hunt is on. David's moving, Saul's moving. He's, the spies are actively making reports back to both. And Saul went on this side of the mountain and David and his men on that side. There was a, a crag in the rock there, a kind of a, a scene where you could be on one side or the other. And it seems as though David and his men were on one side and Saul and his men were on the other side. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. <clears throat> if, if you understand what's being said here, David and his men were in this one side where Saul and his men were on the other. And Saul, of course, had way more 
soldiers. David had 600 men. Saul probably had three or 4,000. So David is, is kind of trapped in this sense because he's in this, this way that he can't get out easily and with Saul's men over above them on the other side, it's going to be just a matter of time and they're going to come down on David. So David made haste for fear of Saul, for Saul and his men compassed David and his men round about to take them. So they're closing in is the idea. There's no real easy way to get out of this. So they're kind of stuck, they're trapped. And Saul figures that he now can take David out. Finally, we've got him trapped. Look at the first word of verse 27. But. (laughs) This is always the way it works. Saul thinks he's got the, oh, finally, we're going to get him. He's trapped. But. There came a messenger unto Saul. Huh. A messenger comes to Saul and says, Haste thee and come, for the Philistines have invaded the land. Now, I just have to figure, this is intervention from God. Who sent the messenger? I think the Lord did. And he's, he's bringing a message that Saul can't refuse. The Philistines are attacking our land, so Saul has to make a choice here. And so it says, verse 28, wherefore Saul returned from pursuing after David. He had to go fight the Philistines. I mean, that, it's kind of a, you know, one or the other, but Saul knows if he doesn't go fight the Philistines, he's going to lose more that way than by giving up on David right now. So he, he quit pursuing David and went against the Philistines Therefore, they called that place Selah Hamalakoth, which, by the way, means the cliff of divisions. This is the the cliff was a two-sided kind of cliff. David on one side, Saul and his men the other. So eventually they meet up, and that's why Saul figured he could take him out. But David was delivered there, so they They named that place and and remembered it. The Jews still remember this place that's called this because this is where David was kind of delivered from Saul. So then it says, And David went up from thence and dwelt in strongholds at En Gedi. All these places are in the wilderness of Israel. En Gedi is a kind of an oasis of sorts. There's, a, there's plenty of water there. There's caves, and there's wildlife. So for someone hiding out and, and trying to survive, En Gedi was perfect because you could, you could get plenty of water. There was game to hunt and, and eat, feed on, you know, and then there was caves everywhere for shelter. So if you're going to be stuck somewhere, En Gedi is a perfect place to be. And if, if you ever go to Israel and go to En Gedi, it's one of our favorite spots. We hike back up this trail, and there's this waterfall and a pool. And, I mean, you can just see David sitting there. And, by the way, many of the psalms that David wrote were penned at En Gedi. And, in fact, when this happened, David wrote a psalm about it. I'm going to read it to you. It's Psalm 54. And this is titled, A Psalm of David, when the Zephims came and said to Saul, doth not David hide himself with us? (laughs) So David, when he gets to En Gedi, after he's been betrayed by another whole group of people now, he goes to En Gedi and writes this psalm. And this is what David writes. Verse 1, he says, Save me, O God. A good way to start, right? Just save me. O God, by thy name, and judge me by thy strength. Hear my prayer, O God, and give ear to the words of my mouth. For strangers are risen up against me, and oppression seek after my soul. They have not set God before them, Selah. Selah means stop and think about it. So what David declares and wants to ponder for a minute is these that are following after him, trying to take him down, those people have not placed God in the proper place. 
they don't have the right perspective of God. That's why they could hunt David. He says, Behold, God is mine helper. The Lord is with them that uphold my soul. Ah, David knows that he's in such a relationship with God that anyone that would uphold David would be working for God. So he says, the Lord is with them that uphold my soul. In other words, you sent them to me, God, if they're, if they're upholding me and, and blessing me. And he goes on and says, and he shall reward evil unto mine enemies. Cut them off in thy truth. This is directed at Saul and those that have turned on him. But like I've mentioned before, and you'll see it again and again in the story of David, David will say all this to God in prayer. But he never says this to anybody else. So he, he doesn't talk to his men. He doesn't talk to those that are around him about Saul or about the Ziphims or, or the people of Keilah that turned on him. He doesn't, you won't hear David going, what's wrong with those people? I spared their lives. I fought the Philistines for them. And then the first chance they get, they turn on me. Hate those people. No. Wouldn't you think there'd be something? Like David's like, okay, fine. I'm coming back to Keilah, but I'm not fighting the Philistines this time. But nothing, there's nothing. There's nothing like that mentioned. He doesn't talk about Saul that way. He doesn't talk about those that betrayed him. Only to the Lord does he speak those things. And he knows God can take them out and cut them off in his truth. He can deal with them. But he says, David says, I will freely sacrifice unto thee. I will praise thy name, O Lord, for it is good. For he hath delivered me out of all trouble, and mine eye hath seen his desire upon mine enemies. David hasn't seen that yet. He's hiding in En Gedi when he writes this. But he knows it. He knows it by faith. And that's just as good as it being done. And I wonder, do we kind of have to see it before we believe it? Or do we believe it because God says it? And even though physically we haven't seen it come to pass, is it just as good as done? David uses a, a tense there that is indicative of, I've already seen him deliver me. It's already over. It's already done. He knows that God is with him. Therefore, he doesn't have to, to fear. But I love this because you and me have so many promises. How many promises do we have of, from God? Do you know? Do you even have a clue? Well, let me just put it this way. It's in the thousands. Thousands of promises in the scriptures to you, to me, from God. Thousands of them, right? And, and we love certain ones more than others, I think. You know, because God promises to never leave us or forsake us. I like that one. Got it highlighted, underlined, right? I circle certain promises. Oh, God, I like that one, right? Certain promises, though, I don't think we highlight, right? Like, yea, all those who live godly shall suffer persecution. Yeah. <laughs> David heard from the Lord in this chapter we saw, right? So God, is Saul coming after me? And are these people going to turn on me? Yep. That's a promise. Yes, they are. <laughs> they're coming, and they're going to turn on you. And that's not all. Wait till you get to the Ziphites. Right? Wait, because they're just going to go voluntarily to Saul and tell him that you're there. So those are promises as well. In other words, God 
says things to us, and they're all good, and they're all promises, even though they don't all sit well with us. But here's the deal. You've got to see that what God has said, he will complete and do. He will finish it, and there's never a time you should be so overwhelmed and so fearful and anxious about things that are happening because it's not over yet. Is that hard for us to deal with? When you're going through something, it's like you wish it was over, right? But you have your own agenda on how this is going to be over. I try to manipulate it to be over. You? Like if you're going through something different, don't you try and take, take it by the reins and, okay, we are going to make this different, <laughs> right? Have you ever felt the tug the wrestling match, God has a different plan, but you, boy, you're determined to pull this thing a different direction, and it's frustrating, it's difficult, and makes the challenge even more hard than it is to begin with. But here's the, here's the deal. You and me know that God has a plan, right? I mean, if you don't know that by now, listen, he has a plan for you and for me, and he's going to finish it but he's going to do it his way. So I think David liked the idea of being king of Israel. I'm not so sure David was all that hot on the refining process that would take place to get him equipped to be the king of Israel. And you and me are going to be beside the king of kings in eternity, ruling and reigning with Christ. Amen? I mean, I like that. I like that part. But what about the part here where it's like the refining process? To get me to that place where I'm ready, where I'm equipped. You know, there was a a story of an old carpenter in the days when my my grandfather was a a carpenter uh, back in Philadelphia. And uh, from what I understand, I, I really... Didn't know him much. I, I think he was, I think he was gone when I was three years old or something. But anyway, I heard my mom talk about my dad, uh, her dad, all the time. And he was a carpenter in those days when they were building Victorian houses back east. And uh, carpenters back then, they had to make everything. Like in, any of the gingerbready stuff that you see on those houses. The carpenter had to make those things. He had to carve them and scroll them and all that stuff. They were craftsmen back then, right? They didn't just go down to Home Depot and, oh, there's a nice looking, (laughs) right? Put some of those up. Although if there was Home Depots back then, I'm sure they would have loved that. But the point is is that if they wanted to look a certain way, they had to carve it. And there was a story of a a person walking along a street one day and there's a, a carpenter, right? And he's working away. And the person looks up, and right at the, the, the eave of the house, right at the front eave, he noticed that there was a piece missing in that corner, right in the, right in the very wedge of the corner. And so uh, he walks over to the carpenter. He says, hey, I don't know if you noticed, but there's a piece missing up there. And the carpenter says, yeah, I'm working on it right now. He says, I- I'm, I'm cutting on it here so that it'll fit in up there. So the cutting happens here. And so that piece fits there. And you and me are getting cut on here. Refining takes place here so that when we get there, we fit. And sometimes that's not fun. You know, getting cut on, carved on, heated up, you know, stretched, pulled out of shape, and all that. But it's it's good because we're getting shaped into the image of Christ. And you know what? The further I am from Christ, the more that hurts. (laughs) That's okay. That's a good pain. 
It really is. There's bad pain too, I know that. But there's good pain. And the pain that God is allowing in my life, it's shaping me, it's good for me. Amen? Amen. Let him do it. Let him have his way, you know? I I love this story because David's trusting in God. He trusts him. I trust you, God. Let's pray. And God, we just, we want to be like that. We want to trust you more. We know that there's some things that are difficult for us to embrace. There are things that we, we don't particularly like that happen to us. But you are faithful, God, and you have a desire for us to, to really be able to enjoy to the fullest the lives you've given us and, and having the close intimacy with you that, that we're really longing for, even though sometimes that gets clouded. We, we pray that you'd be just freed up today to continue to work in us and shape us and mold us. I pray that the things that we are, are painfully having to deal with at times, we would understand that we're not alone. David and all your saints have gone through the same kinds of things. And we can trust that whatever you're doing will be accomplished and and perfected in your time, in your way. So we love you for that. And these truths that we look at, we just thank you that you're faithful to reveal them. And uh, we want to embrace them. So help us to take this in and uh, really let it be in us your word, and and shaping us as your spirit would do that faithfully. We pray it, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His graces? Or are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed? Are you washed in the blood? In the blood? In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin And be washed in the blood of the Lamb There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb Are you washed? Are you washed? In the blood In the blood In the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Some glad morning when this life is over I'll fly away To a home on God's celestial shore I'll fly away Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away To a land where joy shall never end I'll fly away Yeah, I'll fly away, oh glory I'll fly away And when I die, hallelujah, by and by 
fly.